if you can recall a time that you've experienced culture shock. Have you ever experienced culture shock? It's that disorienting feeling when you step into a, a new culture and suddenly everything is strange. People's behavior, their food, their language, even their daily routines. You know, it's probably more pronounced if you travel to a, a foreign country, but you can probably even feel it if you just move within regions in the States. You know, I, I remember walking through a market in Beijing, China, and seeing pig brains for sale, meant for human consumption, or the experience there of haggling for every purchase. Negotiating the price was just, just part of the process. And, you know, lanes, lanes on the roads were merely suggestions. Cars and scooters just went wherever they could fit on the road. And as, as disorienting as culture shock might be, it is a helpful reminder that we all have a culture. You know, sometimes the culture that we live in can be invisible to us. It's, it's just like the air that we breathe. So it's not until we're exposed to something different, a different culture, that we become aware of what we've assumed all along, our, our own culture. And the same, friends, is true of the church. Every social group, the church included, has its, its own culture, that set of shared beliefs, behaviors, even lingo and, and rituals. You know, and you can learn about a church kind of like you can learn about China on, on paper, you know, what a church, you know, for example, believes in its confession of faith. But, but every church, again, just like Beijing, China, has its own feel, its aroma, its culture that you can't know until you get there. So the question that we are going to be considering this morning, friends, is what is our church's culture? It might be invisible to you, but we do have a culture. As we continue our sermon series, DNA, who we are at SBC, today we consider our culture. So two weeks ago, if you were here, Pastor Paul introduced us to our eight core commitments, and which included the commitment to gospel culture. So today we are double-clicking on that second commitment to think more about what it means to have a, a gospel culture and how we might go about cultivating such a culture. And today, we're going to spend some time in the second chapter of the book of Galatians. So, if you have your Bible, I invite you to open with me there to Galatians chapter 2. We'll also consider a number of other passages as well, but, but our sermon today, Galatians 2, Cultivating Gospel Culture. Galatians 2, Cultivating Gospel Culture. We'll read the entire chapter, all 21 verses of Galatians 2, in just a minute. But before we do, I think we'll be helped by starting with some definitions up front, definitions that we'll be working with for the rest of our study. So we're going to start today by defining first culture. First culture. Often, when Christians think about culture, it's something bad. You might think of pop culture as movies, music, TV, and art. But, but simply put, culture is the shared way of life, beliefs, customs, and practices of a group of people. Culture is the shared way of life, beliefs, customs, and practices of a group of people. You know, cust uh, culture can be as wide as an entire nation or as small as a, a church, this group of people. And, and culture is not necessarily a bad thing. Culture can be pleasing to God or not. We can have a shared way of life, beliefs, customs, and practices that bring honor to God or that do not bring honor to God. So friends, again, the church is a group of people. It has a culture too. Our aim though then at Stafford Baptist Church is to cultivate a particular culture. We are committed to having a gospel culture. Okay, so we've defined culture. What's a gospel culture? So our second definition this morning is 
the gospel. The gospel, maybe in its simplest terms, is the good news of what God has done in Christ. It is an announcement. It is is news. It is telling us what God has done for us to save us from our sins in Christ. You can summarize the gospel in four words. God, man, Christ response. Four words. God, man, Christ response. First, God. God is perfectly holy and good, and He created not only everything, but, but mankind in His image to reflect His glory. But second, man has rebelled against God, and every person now lives for his own glory. Every person deserves God's justice, His righteous opposition against our sin in eternal condemnation. But third, God. God has sent in love His Son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us. God, man, Christ. Jesus Christ lived the life that that we should have lived and died the death that we deserve in our place. When Jesus died on the cross, He wasn't just giving us an example of, of what great love looked like. No, He actually, on the cross, became our substitute. He took our sins upon Him, the sins of all who would ever turn away from their sins and trust in His death for us. And on the cross, He suffered God's good wrath against our sin in our place. But He didn't stay dead. No, three days later, He was risen from the dead to show that God had accepted His offering. God, man, Christ, and fourth, response. Now, forgiveness of sins and eternal life is offered to all who respond to this news by trusting in His death and turning away from sin. In Christ, we receive new spiritual life, as a gift from God, and are filled with God's Spirit to now empower us to to actually live in obedience to God, to live in a way that pleases Him. And one day, Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead and renew all creation so that those who trust in Him will live with Him forever. God, man, Christ, response. That is the good news, the announcement of what God has done for all who trust in Him in Christ. So we've defined already culture and now gospel. So what would gospel culture be? What do we mean when we say we are, as a church, committed to gospel culture? Well, our our main idea today and what I hope to show from the Bible for the rest of our sermon, the truth about Jesus, gospel doctrine, When believed, we'll create lives shaped by Jesus, gospel culture. That big idea, one more time, the truth about Jesus, that is gospel doctrine, when believed, will create lives shaped by Jesus, that is gospel culture. And we study this morning Galatians 2 because it's a great example of that principle, our big idea. So we're going to read all this morning of Galatians 2 to see one example of that principle, that big idea, that what we believe about Jesus should create lives shaped by Jesus. So just to introduce Galatians 2, because it's not a book we've been studying recently, Paul here is telling the story about a time when one of the apostles, Peter, failed to connect gospel doctrine with gospel culture. So Peter failed to connect what was true about Jesus and the gospel with how he should be living. So Galatians 2, when we read it in just a moment, is going to show us that that right doctrines, right beliefs about Jesus and the gospel are essential, but they're not the end. No, the truth about Jesus, when believed, needs to create lives that are shaped by Jesus. So we're going to read through all of Galatians 2 and then work back through it to make a few observations about gospel culture. But before we read, it is appropriate for us to pause and ask for God's help. So please pray with me before we read of His Word. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before Your Word to to hear the living words of the living God, we pray that You would give us grace that Your Word would be living and active this morning, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing 
the division of joint and marrow, or that it would expose this morning what is in our hearts, what is in our culture as a church. Oh, Father, we pray that this morning we would see the truth about Jesus, not just as truth, but impact for how we live every day as those who claim to follow Him. We pray this all in His precious name. Amen. One last instruction, kids, as we read, can you count how many times Paul uses the phrase, the gospel? He's talking about the gospel. Count how many times he uses that phrase, the gospel. And adults, try to notice, what gospel doctrine is Paul talking about in Galatians? And how does he expect it to inform how we live in our culture? Let's read Galatians 2, starting in verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, When they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, well, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised." Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. The Word of the Lord. Well, kids, how many times... Did Paul mention the phrase, the gospel? I hope you counted with me five. That's right, five. Well, clearly, Paul is concerned with preserving the truth of this gospel, the gospel. And in particular, I hope you noticed the truth that we are justified, we are made right before God, not by works, but by faith. And really, the whole book of Galatians, chapters 1 through 6, is a defense of this gospel doctrine that we are declared right in the courtroom of God's justice, not by works in obedience to the law, like circumcision, what was commanded of the Jews, but rather by faith, by faith in Jesus Christ. So, chapter 2 begins with Paul recounting a story of a visit to Jerusalem. 
where the gospel that he had been preaching among the Gentiles was affirmed by the pillars of the church there. You see that in, in verse 2, he, he went up to make sure, to present before them the gospel, to make sure that his work hadn't been in vain. He mentions bringing Titus along. He uh, is an uncircumcised Greek co-worker of Paul, and even he was not forced to be circumcised, he says there in verse 3. No, rather, there in verse 6, he says the pillars of this church in Jerusalem added nothing to his gospel. You know, the gospel that Paul had been preaching of, of grace to the uncircumcised Gentile, that, that gospel was affirmed, right? They, they agree with him. It is not necessary for these Gentiles to live like Jews, particularly by being circumcised, to be right with God. And we can imagine this, this interaction with the pillars of the church in Jerusalem to be something like passing the bar exam to practice law, right? It's not like Paul, previous to this, Paul didn't know the gospel and he was learning here. Rather, it's, it's rather just him, him being accredited, if you will, by the Jerusalem church. They, get, they give him their seal of approval that he's able to, to practice his gospel ministry among the Gentiles. Well, all that to say, what we have recounted here by Paul is to say that his gospel doctrine that he had received by divine revelation was true. But there is that but in verse 11. The scene shifts away from Jerusalem and now to the city Antioch. That's where Paul's home church was, and it's a mixed church of Jews and Gentiles. And the church here in Antioch has a visitor called here Cephas, there in verse 11. It's another name for the same Peter mentioned back in verses 7, 8, and 9. It's one of those Jerusalem pillars. We just established, right, that, that Paul and Peter are agreed on gospel doctrine, right, that the gift of salvation is by grace, not by works of the law like, for example, circumcision. But what happened? Well, verse 12 says that Peter had been eating with Gentiles there in Antioch. You see, Jewish law had forbidden Jews from eating with Gentiles, but because of the gospel doctrine of justification by faith, the two, Jews and Gentiles, could now eat together in the church. But Peter is influenced by a group of people in verse 12 called the circumcision party. You know, they clearly, by their name, think that circumcision is important. And Peter draws back from eating with the Gentiles and, by doing so, influences the rest of the Jews and even Barnabas to do the same, to stop eating with Gentiles in Antioch. And the principle is clearly stated there for us in verse 14. Paul says that Peter's conduct, along with the rest of the Jews, was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. And just to be clear here, it's not as if Peter in Antioch was now preaching a different gospel doctrine. No, he hasn't changed gospel doctrine, but the way he is behaving, Paul says, is not in step with the gospel doctrine. There is, in other words, a way to live that is in step with the gospel and a way to live that is not in step with the gospel. Or, as we put it in our main idea this morning, the truth about Jesus, gospel doctrine, when believed, will create lives shaped by Jesus, gospel culture. So Paul goes on in the next verses here in Galatians 2 to call out Peter and the Jews and remind them of the gospel doctrine that they had believed. What we have in verses 15 through 21 are a wonderful statement of the doctrine of justification by faith. It says there in verse 16, yet we know. What do we know, Peter? That a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. How clearer can he be? And so he concludes in verse 20, there, I for have been crucified with Christ. It is I no longer who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is he reminding Peter and the Jews of? Notice, to correct their wrong culture, he first reminds them of the gospel, of Christ's love, of his death, of his grace, of his justification available by faith. It is the truth about Jesus, when believed, that creates gospel culture. The gospel changes who sits at our dinner table, Paul is arguing here. And once you notice this pattern, what we just looked at in Galatians 2, it is everywhere in the New Testament. So I want to spend the next few minutes giving you three examples. If you're taking notes, I apologize for the lack of points, but we're going to leave Galatians 2 behind and take a brief tour of three prominent New Testament examples of the very same principle that we are proving here in Galatians 2. Two weeks ago, in introducing our commitment to gospel culture, Paul used the example of Romans 15.7. So we're going to start there. Romans 15.7 to prove this principle. It says, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of of God. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Do you see gospel doctrine there in Romans 15, 7? He puts it in just four words. Christ has welcomed you. That's gospel doctrine. How is it that Christ has welcomed us? This is the good news of the Bible. What is the good news? Well, the gospel says that Christ has welcomed us even when we were his enemies. He welcomed us who are unlike him. He welcomed us with warmth, eagerly. He welcomed us not to be just his servants, but to be a part of his family. And if that's the gospel doctrine, Christ has welcomed you. Therefore, Paul says, Romans 15, 7, welcome one another like that. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Do you see what kind of culture this gospel creates? It's a tragedy when churches have an unwelcoming culture that holds up their noses when people visit who, who they don't think fit their idea of what a respectable visitor might look like. Or when churches have a, a culture that forms cliques of of members who are just like one another. Oh, that has nothing of the aroma of the gospel. Practically, that means, Stafford Baptist, that you should go out of your way as a member of this church to greet people who are new, to greet people who are not like you, and to do so with eager warmth, as Christ has welcomed you. My, my old pastor used to tell his closest friends that he would likely not talk to them on Sunday. He'd just give them that warning in advance. I'm probably going to ignore you on Sundays. Instead, he wanted to use the, the few precious moments after service to talk to new people or people that he normally didn't get the chance to talk to throughout the week. Brothers and sisters, that's gospel culture. Let's make that a part of our culture, our shared behavior because of the gospel. Let's focus the, the first minutes after our service talking to people who need our welcome, not the people you already know best, your, your best friends, because Christ has welcomed you. Well, that's our first example in Romans 15, 7. We have two more. Our second example is Ephesians 4.32, part of the passage that we read earlier in our service. There, Paul writes this. He says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Do you see the gospel doctrine there? God in Christ forgave you. How has He forgiven us? What is the good news of the gospel? It is that you in Christ have been forgiven completely. There is therefore now no condemnation 
in Christ Jesus. There is nothing that we owe to God at all. He has forgiven us in response to our our genuine and continued repentance. He has forgiven us an immense debt, a debt that we could never repay. And He has forgiven us with joy and offered repeated assurance of His forgiveness to us. If you are in Christ, the good news of the gospel is that all of your transgressions, past, present, and future, are fully forgiven by God in Christ. Therefore, therefore, we are to be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Do you see what kind of culture the gospel creates? Like Jesus first treated us, we are to treat one another with kindness, tenderness, and eagerness to forgive. In fact, let me put it this way, a little bit controversially. Sin is not an obstacle to gospel culture. Unrepentant sin is. The truth is, every sin, uh, sorry, every church you ever go to will be filled with sinners. We will continue to sin. And yes, all sin is an offense against God, but we want to have a culture that is honest with our continued sin. Every person in this church, in Stafford Baptist Church, from your pastors all the way down to the the newest and youngest member, has an imperfect gospel doctrine and an imperfect gospel lifestyle. We just read, if, if even the pillar of the church in Jerusalem, Peter, can sin, well, certainly so will each one of us. And in fact, If we are about cultivating a gospel culture here, our sin then becomes an opportunity to actually practice gospel culture. You know, if there was in the church never any sin, we would never have the opportunity to be forgiving. And what is more central to a gospel kind of culture than forgiveness? Friends, we want to be the kind of church that loves one another well by confessing and forgiving sin. The New Testament makes it clear in Matthew 5, Matthew 18, Galatians 6, that everyone in the church has a responsibility to address sin, the offender, the offended, and the observer. And the Bible expects us to address sin directly to the other party rather than than spreading a a negative report in in slander and in gossip. We notice this is exactly what Paul did to Peter in Galatians 2, go directly to the offender and speak to them. The Bible calls on us in the church to address sin with humility after removing the log from our own eye, knowing that we too are prone to sin and and in need of grace and rebuke every day. This is what gospel culture is like, a gospel that takes sin seriously but is kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. So let's be a church that has that kind of culture, Stafford Baptist. You know, 1 Peter 4.8 says that love covers a multitude of sins. So part of a gospel culture is the kind of love that has, has resources within from Jesus to cover when people sin against us. But but sometimes sin needs to be addressed. So let's be a church that addresses it with this gospel culture, with kindness, with tenderness, and with forgiveness. Well, that's our our second example, Ephesians 4.32, our third and final example in our brief tour of the New Testament proving this principle, a bit longer this time, Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Again, Paul writes to the church, now at Philippi, he says, do nothing, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men." And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Do you see there the gospel doctrine? Jesus Christ, the good news, emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and humbled himself even further to the point of death, death on a cross. How was Christ humble? You know, the incarnation, Jesus taking on the form of of mankind would be the humblest act in all of history were it not surpassed by His humble death. The God of all glory who deserves worship and service of every creature came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. He descended from the throne of heaven to the dishonor of the cross. And do you see what kind of gospel culture that gospel doctrine creates? Can you imagine a group of people who do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, each of them counts the other more significant than themselves? That's gospel culture. That's what the church should be like. The gospel creates a people who have descended not to seek honor for themselves, but to give it up for the good of others like Jesus did for us. Stafford Baptist, for all of us who are not God, it is not humble to choose to be humble like Jesus. True humility is realizing that you have no reason to be arrogant. No, you have no choice but to be humble. So friends, let's make that a part of our gospel culture where every member is busy in humility considering what would be done in the spiritual interest of the other. What can you do this week to lay down yourself, maybe perhaps for the first time, that would serve your fellow church member as you in humility, like Christ, count them as more significant than yourself? The truth about Jesus, gospel doctrine, when believed, will create lives shaped by Jesus, gospel culture. Friends, that's just three examples that we pull out from the New Testament. We could multiply examples. This has not nearly been exhaustive of what should define our culture. The point of these three examples is merely to prove the principle that is everywhere in the New Testament that the Bible grounds our living, our culture together in what God has done for us in Christ. One is the root, what God has done for us in Christ, and the other is the fruit, our gospel culture. And it's important, friends, not to get that order reversed, to try to live in a certain way in order to get to earn God's good grace for us. Right? If we do, if we reverse the order, we'll be making the same mistake that Peter made in Antioch, implying that there is something that we need to do in order to earn salvation. Kids, in fact, this is what you have been learning downstairs. Do you remember the big question that you've been going over? Obedience is our response to God's love for us. Obedience is our response to God's love for us. We obey God, we welcome, we forgive, we serve others, not in order to earn God's love. No, we we can't. No, it is response to God's love for us, His love in the gospel. Kids, how we live in obedience is rooted in God's love for us in the gospel. Okay, so now we've seen this principle in Galatians 2. We've considered three examples of it. Now we are briefly going to consider how to cultivate this culture in our church. We're going to consider how to cultivate this culture in our church. And it should be no surprise to you that it begins with the gospel. It's right there in the name, gospel culture. If we want to be a church where this culture marks us, where our culture comes from the gospel, we need to be familiar with the gospel. 
This is, in fact, why we insist on preaching the gospel every week here, wherever we are in the Bible. It is not. The gospel is not just, you know, the start of the Christian life, how you get saved. No, it's more like the hub of the Christian life. Every other part of Christian life radiates out from the gospel and is held together by this hub. So, friends, make it a frequent habit to meditate on the gospel. Make it a frequent habit to meditate on the gospel. Let me encourage you to to memorize Scripture filled with gospel doctrine. You could take that list, what we considered this morning, just there, Romans 15, 7, Ephesians 4, 32, Philippians 2, 3 through 8, and, and memorize those Scriptures so that you can be rooted in the truth that gospel doctrine leads to gospel culture. Memorize Scripture filled with gospel doctrine. Listen to music that is filled with the gospel. When you have some free time in the car or as you're getting ready for your day or even as you close your day, listen to music that is filled with the gospel. I remember a particular difficult job I had when I was younger, and I brought along a CD with me, Songs for the Cross-Centered Life. That's a CD, Songs for the Cross-Centered Life. And I just listened to that on repeat because I knew it would remind me of the gospel in my anxiety. To so listen to good music that is filled with the gospel. Friends, let me recommend that you read good books that will help you understand the person and work of Jesus more deeply. One of my own personal commitments is I won't let a year go by without reading at least one book that helps me better understand the gospel or remember what I've forgotten about the gospel. If you need recommendations, we'd be happy to provide those for you. Probably my first pick would be just the the simple book, The Gospel by Greg Gilbert. The Gospel by Greg Gilbert. To be reminded every year and grow deeper in understanding of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Friends, this might be a hard one. Instead of checking out when the sermon gets to the gospel because you know it, let me encourage you to lean in because you know you need it. It can be repetitive, week in, week out, hearing here from the the pulpit the gospel. And and often we say it in in similar ways, but let me encourage you to to be focused, to, to lean in in those moments, to focus And to pray, even in that moment, God, help me to hear this with fresh ears, because I need it. It is the hub of the Christian life. Friends, to continue meditating on the gospel, when you read your Bible every day, make it your aim to find just some nugget, some little bit of the gospel in whatever you read that morning. Certainly, all of the Bible is a testimony to the gospel, from Genesis to Revelation. So look for something in In whatever you read, something that teaches you maybe about the need for the gospel. Maybe it's teaching us about our sin. Or find a a promise or a pattern of the gospel. The Bible is filled with these kinds of patterns and promises of the gospel. Or maybe find something there in what you read about the God that accomplishes the gospel. What attribute of God is this teaching that tells me that the God who is acting here is the same God who promises and will accomplish the gospel? So when you read your Bible, friends, make it your aim to find some nugget of the gospel there and take that with you. I love the image of of taking that that little gospel nugget as a a hard candy and putting it under your tongue and just just enjoying it for the rest of your day, slowly letting letting it fill your mouth, fill your mouth with the flavor of the gospel as you go about your day. Personally, to help me meditate on the gospel, I keep a page folded in my Bible that's printed with just a few catechism questions on it that are always, for me, heart-stirring reminders of the gospel. Is there something like that for you that you can keep with you as you go about your day that will remind you of, your gospel, of the gospel? Maybe you can put it in your purse, your wallet, put it on your, your mirror in your bathroom or on the steering wheel of your car to help you meditate on the truths of the gospel. And finally, friends, talk about the gospel with others. This is a way that we can help this is actually a part of gospel culture, is a church that loves to talk about Jesus, what He has done for us. So when someone asks you this week how you're doing, tell them something about the gospel that's given you fresh joy or help. Maybe there's something this morning that we've considered about the gospel that is it particularly encouraging to you. Well, share that. When someone asks how you're doing, mention that to them. And surprisingly, you can even do this with non-Christians when they ask you how you're doing as an opportunity to talk to them about the gospel.
Friends, if we are going to be a church that is marked by gospel culture, it begins with being familiar with the gospel. Meditate on the gospel day in and day out with all of the details from Genesis to Revelation on the person and work of our Savior. So that's, that's the first half of how we cultivate gospel culture here. Meditate on the gospel. Second, we need to practice living in light of that gospel. Notice, if you think back on the examples that we've considered this morning, how all of them can only happen in deep and intentional relationships. You know, for example, Galatians, that was all about who you're having at your dinner table, right? When we thought about Ephesians, it's about who we are forgiving and being tender and kind to. When we thought about Romans, it's about who we're welcoming. When we thought about Philippians, it's about who we're considering more significant than ourselves in service. If a culture is a shared way of life in a social group, well, we need to then share our lives. You know, no group is going to build much of a culture if we're just in and out one day a week. No, this is why, as a church, most of our events are social in nature. They are intentionally meant to be an opportunity for us to build relationships so that every member of this church can be a part of gospel community. Friends, that's why we have things like small groups, like men's breakfast, women's tea and truth, and family night. It is because we are, as a church, committed to gospel culture. And in order to have a a culture, we need to live with each other. You know, and those things I, I, I list, small groups, men's breakfast, women's teen truth, and family night, did you notice all of them revolve around a meal? We wouldn't be Baptists if that wasn't true. Now, friends, we need to eat with. We need to welcome. We need to forgive. We need to serve one another, along with a whole list of one another's in the Bible, all springing from the truths of the gospel. The Bible is very clear that a Jesus-shaped life will not show up in isolation. You know this well. Love in the Bible is not just a feeling. It's not just words. No, it is an action. An action done particularly to those who are different, those who sin against you, those who have real needs that you can meet. So church, let me encourage you then to be involved in our life together. This is what it means to be a church shaped by the gospel. And not everyone has the same opportunities to be involved in the life of this church in the same ways, but I would encourage you to to find one way, to think of one way that you haven't been involved in the life of this church in the past and make it your aim to do so this year. And come fresh, meditating off on the gospel. Make sure that before you gather with your brothers and sisters in Christ, that you do so fresh off meditating on the gospel with the intention to form their gospel life in this social group, the body of Christ. Friends, the question before us this morning, what is our culture? Maybe it's been invisible to you. This is the first time you've been considering it, like the the air that we breathe. How is it that Stafford Baptist Church is going to live together? What is our aroma going to be? Brothers and sisters, let us make this our culture together, one interaction at a time, a culture shaped by the good news of Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection, reign, and return for our salvation. Let us be a church that is so in love with Jesus because of what He has done for us that our every action together is stamped by His love for us. The truth about Jesus, when believed, will create lives shaped by Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise You first and foremost for the good news of the gospel. Father, that your mercy has reached down to us in the despair of our sin. When we could not rescue ourselves from our sin, Lord, your love made a way. 
Lord, we praise you for sending your Son to live the life that we should have lived, to die the death that we deserve, that all who would repent of their sins and trust in his sufficient death would be saved from the wrath of God to not only the forgiveness of sins, but life everlasting in your family. Oh, Father, we pray that you would give us grace to meditate on these truths and many like them every day of our lives. That these truths would not just be cold facts to us, but our very heartbeat of love every day. And Father, we pray that as we meditate on the gospel, we would be a people whose lives are shaped by that gospel. That we would live in light of this truth, that we would live like Jesus as He has loved us, or that we would remember that we love because He first loved us. Well, Father, we pray that we, the saints of Stafford Baptist Church, would be marked by that kind of culture for the glory of Christ, and for the witness of His glory in this world. It's in His, in his name that we pray this. Amen.